Natalie, Dr. Natalie Hinkles is a friend of mine. She's a planetary astrophysicist. I first met her almost a year ago on this stage where we both gave a TEDx talk, and, and her talk was uh, the oddity of, of planet hunting, the oddity of finding another Earth, and she blew the roof off the place. And um, uh, my talk was about how to make birdhouses out of oatmeal boxes. So. <laughs> Wasn't, wasn't quite as good. So, so there was the TED talk, and she was also, she would come on out, she was also on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. You probably heard her on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me at the NPR, the NPR quiz show. And um, she and her husband were featured in an episode of Life After Lockup, I think. Is that right? No. 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 That's a oh, oh, that, okay. I'm sorry. I got I got these notes wrong. Okay, but no no less than George Takei, the uh, Mr. Sulu on the original Star Trek, um, once called her a trailblazer. How impressive is that? She studies the composition of stars close to the sun, which she also uses to understand the makeup of planets outside of our solar system or exoplanets, uh, since stars and planets are formed at the same time. Like. Who didn't know that? <laughs> so, so she moved to San Antonio a year ago with her husband and cat. She enjoys rock climbing, swimming, and drinking bourbon. And one time she reversed the order of that, and it just wasn't very good at all. She just, it was actually really amazing. Yeah. So get ready to be impressed. This is my friend, Dr. Natalie Hinkle. <laughs> can, you, can, you, can you see the little rocket ship? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> You're a nut. Thank you, everyone. I really, really appreciate being here. Thank you to Vicky, of course, and the ineffable Gary Sweeney for wearing a rocket ship shirt just for me. I also wanted to say thank you to the city of San Antonio. Um, I've only been here for about a year, and I have to say I feel like so warm, so welcome, like meeting people, going to a lot of different really awesome, cool places. So it's just been really an, an excellent year, so I just really appreciated that. So, as Gary mentioned, I am a planetary astrophysicist, and I will tell you this is actually a title I made up to describe what I do, because not a lot of people in the world actually do it. Um, so today, I'm going to be talking with you about my research and the history of the biggest project that I've ever worked on. I call this Patterns in the Hypatia Catalog. I love to look at stars in the night sky and think about big patterns in the galaxy. Many scientists needle down into the details of a question, but I like to stay broad and wide, shifting my focus to learn new ideas and apply methods from fields other than my own. While this may be more difficult, it allows me to understand the events in our universe that made stars the way that we see them today. How is the star moving, but also how is it formed and what is its composition? Stars are made up of dozens of raw elements like silicon, carbon, and iron. No two stars have the exact same composition. The quantity of the elements is unique in a way that is similar to our DNA, which traces the path of our ancestors. Stars also pass their chemical signatures to their planets, because stars and planets are formed at the same time. In our quest to find habitable planets outside of our solar system, or exoplanets, it is vital to know the composition of the planet because we as humans depend on elements within the Earth to survive. However, we don't have the technology to measure the makeup of an exoplanet, so we use the star's composition as a proxy. Astronomers measure how much of an element is in the star by observing the light and how it travels through the star. If the light hits an atom like carbon, that atom will absorb a little bit of light in a very specific way. The more atoms there are, the more light is absorbed. Over the last 35 years, different astronomers have measured the same elements within the same stars using a variety of telescopes, instruments, and models. But the measurements and data sets are hard to find. They're in a variety of different books and journals. Without one repository to house all of the data for thousands of stars, it's impossible to get a sense of the bigger patterns. So in 2010, as a graduate student who was new to this field, I decided I would make a change. I would build a massive data of elements and stars that anyone could access. 
This was not a small task. It took me six months just to find 50 data sets. And then I had to learn how to program so that all these data sets, elements and stars measured by different teams, some of those stars have planets, could all be shuffled and combined. And then I realized there was a problem with the data. Different teams got different measurements for the same element in the same star, and that's what you're seeing. This is not <laughs> the scientific method. In fact, it's a huge problem, and here I was, right in the middle of it. So I studied the data closely and found a few ways that we could get everyone and all of the data on the same page. I wrote up all of my results in a very, very long paper. In academia, scientific results need to be written and submitted to a professional journal so that the work can be peer-reviewed by anonymous referees. These referees evaluate your work and give you suggested improvements and modifications. Once everyone agrees it's good, the results are published in the journal and it's generally accepted by the community. The first professional paper I ever wrote was about my database of elements and stars. I submitted it in October 2011 and it was rejected in January claiming that my work would, quote, infect the field with my results. <laughs> I was torn apart. I resubmitted the paper to another journal. And after every set of comments, I would cry until I was hoarse. No one wanted to listen. My paper was ejected again in July 2012. It was even suggested that I fold the effort and move on to something else. But this was years of work. This was the heart of my research, and I wasn't ready to give up. In 2014, I was invited to a conference to give a talk describing my database and, the, and what I had uncovered. I stood in front of 400 people of my colleagues, and I was petrified. But I outlined for them the problem. See, the data, the data didn't match. You can see it for yourself. It should be the same, but it's not. And at the end of my talk, somebody stood up and said, thank you. Thank you for your work. This is so important. Maybe it took forcibly showing people my results because a few months later, my paper was accepted. The anonymous referee turned out to be one of the fathers of my field, and he believed me and helped me to get my research published. I was so ecstatic, I had not one, but two sushi feasts. <laughs> Finally, all of my programming and cross-correlating and analysis, and hard work, and sleepless nights, and tears, and persistence, and determination to not give up on something that I knew would make my community better. It had worked. So I let my accomplishment simmer. I celebrated my victory as much as I mourned my losses and my rejections. But soon I realized that with hundreds of thousands of element measurements and stars, people had no way to access it. So what I needed was an online database. Two years and one false start later, I met a wonderful web developer named Dan Berger. He helped me get astronomy's first multidimensional database, the largest collection of elements within stars near to the sun, online, so it's available to anyone. My database is called the Hypatia Catalog. I named it after one of the first known female astronomers. Hypatia lived around 400 AD in Alexandria and was a force to be reckoned with. She was bold, independent, smart, and well-respected by everyone, both men and women. She was determined to be the person she wanted to be, and I could understand that. I hadn't set out to walk through fire, but when I realized that that was what it took in order for people to listen to me, for them to see what I was seeing, I didn't back down. I couldn't, in all good conscience, let my work get pushed aside as if it didn't mean anything. I knew that it was important to study the big patterns within stars and the data itself, but I didn't anticipate I'd get to watch the patterns of people. My field is shifting now. People are working together to truly understand the composition or DNA of stars in an effort to trace out the history of our galaxy and find planets that would be habitable to life as we know it. Thank you. You're not done yet. I'm not. Okay. My big accomplishment when I was her age was learning how to carve a bong out of an apple. Uh, That's so not let's easy. get to the let's get to this let's get to the good questions first. Is it true outer space smells like burning steak? 
sort of. So astronauts actually do say that it smells like burnt steak. However, it could be a number of things. One is it could be these certain atoms, molecules that are floating around in space that do smell like space. Do smell like burnt steak. However, it could also be that that's what the shuttle smells like. Oh. Once space has uh, been, uh, all the air has been vacuumed out, and then it comes back in. It What's could a, be that oxidizing. new shuttle smell? That yeah, they yeah, have. exactly. It's that. So somebody hung up some air fresheners, like yeah. steak. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so little, maybe, maybe. Little rocket ship. <laughs> Um, so tell me, what, what audience is this Hypatia catalog geared towards? It's actually, it's for everybody. Um, so this is for students. Um, I have people working on it in different high schools. It's for um, people, other scientists in different fields. It's also for experts. So if you like looking at data, playing with data, it's all there. If you just want to make pretty pictures and plots, that's <laughs> there too. And everything is color coded purple because purple is my favorite color. Oh, perfect, perfect. So given the opportunity, would you... Uh, uh, would you consider living on a lunar colony? <laughs> of course. You would? Uh, yeah. Wouldn't that be great? Every astronomer. Of course, they wouldn't ask anybody in here yeah. but you. But, <laughs> but like, okay. I think there's just think of the Facebook post. You could say, thanks for showing me the pictures of your vacation in Port Aransas. Here's my husband, Kaylin, and I on the Sea of Tranquility on the moon. But you'd get it like months, years later. Oh, okay. Yeah, not the, that cool. The, like the Wi-Fi no. isn't good up there? Is <laughs> there is saying? no okay. Wi-Fi. Oh, okay. Um, but no, like every astronomer in their heart, or nearly every astronomer wants to be an astronaut. So yeah. I've, I've actually applied to the astronaut program a few times, but I'm not cool enough. Well, you're young yet. <laughs> you're young. What, and John Glenn was 98 years old when he went Definitely. up there, wasn't he? Something That's like that. True. Okay. So, how can people find out more about on you and the Hypatia catalog? So, um, everything is my name. Oh, great. It's up. All right. So, nataliehinkle.com. That's where you can find me. At Natalie underscore Hinkle is Twitter. And the Hypatia catalog is hypatiacatalog.com. And if you misspell my name, you'll still find me. So. Oh, good. Yep. I'm all over the. You're the, the best. The, what an inspiration. Thank you very much. Thank Dr. You. Natalie Hinkle.